Many of us have seen it before. You are calmly explaining how the virologists have failed to provide adequate evidence for the existence of viruses, and then the rabies joker card is played. But it doesn't really matter because the important thing is that the replication of the virus is supposed to go on at the site of disease, and that's the cause of the disease. So that's where you have to find the viral particles to show that they're actually real. How can you explain that if you, if you touch the saliva of a dog with rabies, uh, that you may, be, that you get, may get, get rabies too, and you will die from it? Despite rabies never coming close to most people's lives, it has long haunted the human imagination. Due to the associations with crazed biting, insomnia, male predominance, and hypersexuality, it has been suggested that the condition may have inspired the mythology of vampires in the 1700s. Unfortunately, the mythology spills into the alleged science behind rabies, and many commonly held fears are unwarranted. So let's take a look at one of virology's supposed trump cards. The first thing we should note about rabies is that it is very rare. For doctors in countries such as New Zealand and Australia, it is something that is never seen. Even in the United States, hardly any doctors would be expected to see a case of rabies in their lifetimes either. In fact, the most recent US surveillance report stated that no human rabies cases were reported in the United States during 2019. From 2000 through 2020, a total of 52 human rabies cases were reported in the United States and its territories, representing a mean of 2.5 cases per year. Globally, cases are mostly confined to third world countries, and there are said to be around 50,000 deaths each year. However, the details concerning these cases are often sketchy, and other estimates are half this number, or even less. The first symptoms of rabies are often non-specific before neurological complications manifest. These include paralysis, confusion, hallucinations and insomnia. Hydrophobia or fear of water can appear in the later stages as well as hypersalivation with the appearance of foaming at the mouth. Before we get into the science of rabies, it is important to differentiate between the existence of a condition versus the claim that it is caused by a virus. There is no doubt that people get sick, and the condition of rabies has an extremely high fatality rate. The problem is that a virus has not been shown to cause rabies. When you want to get the official medico-pharmaceutical industry narrative, a good place to start is with the CDC. When you go to their rabies page, it states that rabies is a fatal but preventable viral disease. It can spread to people and pets if they are bitten or scratched by a rabid animal. We'd better stop there. They've just claimed it is caused by a virus, so we'll see if they can back this up. On their About Rabies page, they describe what they say is the rabies virus, claiming that it is shaped like a bullet with an RNA genome consisting of approximately 12,000 nucleotides. There is also a description of the claimed replication and infection mechanism. But... There are no citations. Let's head on over to Wikipedia and the rabies virus page, where it states that rabies virus, scientific name rabies lysivirus, is a neurotropic virus that causes rabies in humans and animals. And once again, there are no citations for this claim. Under the infection section, it is stated that Joseph Pawan discovered that, quote, infected vampire bats could transmit rabies to humans and other animals. We finally get to a source citation, which is Pawan's 1936 paper, The Transmission of Paralytic Rabies in Trinidad by the Vampire Bat. The paper sets the scene with a fanciful tale where Pawan states, The Encyclopedia Britannica, 1911, quotes Peter Marta as saying, Soon after the conquest of South America by the Spaniards, that in the Isthmus of Darien there were bats which sucked the blood of men and cattle when asleep to such a degree as to even kill them. However, Pawan at least thinks this unlikely, but then introduces his hypothesis that there is some infectious disease transmitted by the bat bites. He then outlines accounts of how the destruction of thousands of dogs failed to stop cases of rabies in some areas. 
After all this slaughter, he stated, the suspicion was therefore again raised that some flying sylvan animal was responsible for the spread of the epidemic. Ominously, he recounts that previous investigators were also drawn to the unusual phenomenon of bats flying around during the day, shrieking and fighting with one another. However, with regard to the speculation, he reported that the evidence was a tad scant. De Souza, 1926, failed to infect guinea pigs and rabbits by allowing philostoma bats to feed on them. And other investigators having also shown from experimental work on rabbits and guinea pigs that bats are not the transmitting agent. Time to forget about what happens in nature and resort to bending the rules in order to keep the theory alive. This is the inspiration for his own experimental method, which goes as follows. All rights reserved. We reserve all rights. The Vampire Bat and Rabies in Trinidad Technique Step 1. The brain and spinal cord of bats and rabbits were removed as soon as possible after death and preserved in sterile glycerin and saline at a temperature of 5 to 10 degrees Celsius until required for use. Step 2. An emulsion or rotting organ soup cocktail was concocted made of a mixture of normal saline solution with approximately 10% made of their cerebrum, cerebellum, medulla or spinal cord. In layman's terms, toxic biological muck soup. Or as they say in New Zealand, a cocked it shit storm, eh? Step 3. The rotting brain and spinal cord soup was then injected directly into the subdural space beneath the tough fibrous membrane that envelops the brain and spinal cord, or intracerebrally, meaning straight into the brains of unsuspecting animals. Because injecting bat and rabbit brains and spinal cords directly into your own brain with a syringe is the best way to accurately simulate an animal bite to your ankle in real life. Amazingly, this invasive assault to the brains of various animals, including monkeys and dogs, caused many of them to become paralyzed and die. Aside from the fact it had nothing to do with the claimed mechanism of transmission through bites, there were no control experiments where similar biological soup said not to contain the alleged infectious agent were injected into the brains of similar animals. In other words, not only was it barbaric, but it was inconsistent with the scientific method and no conclusions about alleged infections could be drawn. Despite this, Pawan goes on to talk about the infection of Trinidad bats with the virus of rabies. This is quite a leap even for the 1930s when the proposed virus model was typically that of an infectious protein rather than the post-1950s rogue genetic code model. But germ theory had certainly taken hold and the war on microbes was all the rage. It would typically take two to three weeks following injection into the animal's brain and its subsequent death, with associated abscesses being reported. Sometimes the animals were slaughtered when they became very unwell and no supportive care was described once their brains had been traumatized. Pawan's paper also discussed Negri bodies, which are microscopic appearances of some of the brain cells in rabid animals. They were first described in 1903 by Adalci Negri, but despite an extensive search, we were not able to find a copy of his paper which translates to Contribution to the Study of the Etiology of Rabies. In any case, Negri bodies are said to be the specific sign of the rabies virus. However, in one of Pawan's experiments, he only found them in 11 out of 20 cases. He offered the explanation that perhaps there was, quote, infection with some allied condition, because if it's not one germ, it must be another, right? Additionally, whether the Negri bodies are present or not does not provide evidence that a rabies virus exists. It simply means that the condition of rabies is associated, seemingly very unreliably, with this particular finding. More inconsistencies appeared in Pawan's paper, including his statement that Bat 4290 was kept in captivity for 161 days and exhibited no abnormal symptoms. 
yet it had been infected in nature and remained infective under artificial conditions during that period. We can see that there are ongoing excuses as to how the alleged virus behaves and quote, infects in order to fit the hypothesis. Another claim is that death can occur from two days to more than six years following a bite. We can see that none of the animal studies provided any evidence that the cause of rabies was a virus per se. That is, a replicating intracellular parasite that can infect and cause disease in a host. So then we get to the images of alleged rabies viruses. This first one is a 3D computer animation of an artist's impression, and I hope that it doesn't fool you for a second. Then we get to the electron micrographs like this one from the CDC. Ah, the old point and declare with the magical arrow technique. In this slide of dead tissue, the structure indicated by arrow C is said to be the virus. However, there is no evidence provided of how this particle is known to fulfill the properties of a virus. If you haven't seen it already, please have a look at my video, Electron Microscopy and Unidentified Viral Objects, which details some of the follies involved in this activity, as well as many of our other videos and articles that expose the invalid techniques used in virology. The association of rabies with animal bites is well reported and 99% of human rabies is said to come from dogs. However, the experimental science surrounding this is surprisingly thin. Obviously, the vast majority of animal bites do not result in rabies, and as already mentioned, Pawan described the failure to induce rabies in test animals when allegedly rabid bats were allowed to freely bite them. I'm not saying that the bites are not important in the development of rabies, but association is different than the words being used to claim a virus is responsible, such as, quote, infection. Historian Gerald Giesen wrote in 1978, that rabies has always been rare in man. It probably never claimed more than 100 victims in any year in France, and French estimates for the years immediately preceding Pasteur's famous work indicate an annual mortality of considerably less than 50. In addition, rabies is not an infectious disease in the usual sense. It is not transmitted from man to man. Because of these two features, general or compulsory vaccination has never seemed appropriate with respect to rabies. There is a very high degree of uncertainty in the correlation between animal bites and the subsequent appearance of rabies, even when the biting animal is certifiably rabid. While the mortality of clinical rabies is virtually 100%, the threat of death from the bite of a rabid animal is vastly less. Most victims of rabid animal bites could forego treatment without experiencing any untoward consequences in the future. This is certainly different from the descriptions provided by the likes of the WHO, who promote the extreme duo-fear narrative and tout vaccines as the solution. Now, Giesen certainly believed in germ theory and vaccinations in general, but with regards to rabies, he was finding the mainstream story hard to swallow. Further back in 1909, Dr. Montague Leveson pointed out that Pasteur's anti-rabic inoculations afford the most decided test of the pernicious character of that method of treatment. During 23 years preceding the use of the anti-rabic serum, there were 685 deaths from rabies in all France, or an average of 30 per annum. But since the use of the anti-rabic inoculations, the average has risen to 100 per annum, with a continually increasing number each year, so that according to the official returns, the numbers of deaths from rabies in France for the year ending in June 1907 was just about 300. In truth, as Professor Peter said in his address to the Academy of Medicine Paris on the 11th of January 1887, Monsieur Pasteur does not cure rabies, he imparts it. You can also head over to Virology and read Mike Stone's commentary on many of the problems with the claims surrounding Pasteur's rabies vaccine. I'll put the link in the description below. Mike also wrote another article recently covering the practice of reclassifying diseases in order to make it look like rabies is absent in some areas. So check that out as well. It is similar to what happened with the reclassification of polio into other diseases after the polio vaccines were introduced. So, is there an explanation as to what causes rabies? As I outlined earlier, the threat to humanity has been blown out of proportion and for almost everyone who watches this video, it is not something that you need to worry about in your personal life. 
you would be far better to concentrate your energy on things that will actually lead to better health outcomes for you and your family. There is no evidence that the clinical condition of rabies is caused by a microbe and certainly not by anything that has been shown to be a virus. Again, it is not to say that tissue damage through the form of a bite cannot cause illness. Rabies is likely to be a form of poisoning with a neurotoxin that can be introduced to mammals through trauma. For example, it could be similar to the toxins that are carried by animals such as pufferfish and the blue-ringed octopus. These animals don't actually produce the neurotoxin themselves. It is secreted by symbiotic bacteria, in the case of the blue-ringed octopus, in its salivary glands. A bite from one of these small octopuses can be fatal for humans. Rabid animals may be in a state that causes a proliferation of toxin-producing bacteria in their mouths or even in another part of their body, and hypersalivation can be one of the ways to rid the body of toxins. So could it be the entry of such toxins into another animal through a bite that causes the condition? Neurotoxins are highly variable in regard to how long they take to act and are not all quick to cause symptoms like snake venom. The effects of currently known neurotoxins include hypersalivation, weakness, restlessness, paralysis, tremor, dysphagia, and coma. This all sounds a lot like clinical rabies, doesn't it? There is no need to shoehorn the virus model into rabies. As we have seen, there is no evidence of any microbe transmitting, and the animal models were not only uncontrolled, but also inappropriately designed to establish such a cause. Don't hold your breath though, as we have seen during the COVID-19 era, investigating the real causes of illness are not in the interests of the powers that shouldn't be. Once again, the virus model and vaccines will be pushed with the claim that the science has been settled. Hopefully, though, you're now more prepared when someone tries to derail your questions about the existence of viruses, and they suddenly interject with, what about rabies then? If you enjoyed this video, please visit supportdrsam.com 